you done now? As they said in the film, Back to the Future, where are we going? We don't need roads. Everybody and welcome to Back to the Future, the podcast, the only podcast looking back in time at the greatest film trilogy of all time, Back to the Future. I am your friend in time, Brad Gilmore, and today on the show, we are in part two of my conversation with Scott Corelli and Nick Jimenez of Back to the Future Minute. We continue our discussions. It's really interesting, very entertaining, and we kind of wrap up talking about where we would like to see a perspective Back to the Future 4 take place. So um, y'all want to stay tuned for that discussion and why I think Back to the Future Part 3 is the best of the series. I don't really think that, but I make a case for it. So uh, y'all check it out. This is Part 2, Scott Corelli, Nick Jimenez, Back to the Future Minute on Back to the Future, the podcast. We are back with Nick Jimenez and Scott Corelli. Nick Jimenez in the news. I always loved that, by the way. I thought that was a nice little uh, touch uh, to your intro there, but uh, now Nick, you're the one who does all the uh, impressions, right? You know, most of them, yeah. <laughs> you're about to go on another thought. Um, you know, well, you, yes, because Scott comes through every once in a while with like a really good like surprise, like home run. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. I talked to a guy named AJ Lacasio who did the voice of Marty McFly on uh, yes. the, the Back to the Future game. who I mean, and if you haven't looked up this guy's impressions on YouTube, I mean, he's phenomenal. He really is. He's phenomenal. But yeah. he couldn't really pin down for me what makes a good Marty McFly impression. What do you think makes a good okay. Marty McFly impression, Nick? Um, You know, for me, whenever I'm doing, it's like my Michael J. Fox is kind of different from my Marty McFly, but it's just because my Marty McFly is always like worried. <laughs> and and like you gotta you gotta like so the voice has got to crack a little bit but he always has to be like a little bit like he, he is he is he is like like morty he really is a very anxious little dude that just something's always out to get him <laughs> out to like cap, like capture him so there, but there there's there's i i would say there is less on the, on the scale of of nervousness and desperation, I think Morty is more in the nervousness, like Woody Allen side, and then right. Marty McFly is more in the desperation, like no, we can't do this. Yeah. Like you're my you're my mommy, I can't kiss you. Yeah, like, like <laughs> yeah. back against the wall. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And you know, Doc. I mean, everyone knows the Doc is constantly in crisis. That's the way to do it. So they're kind of both on edge characters, I guess. When you're impersonating them, I guess they kind of have so, to be. Yeah. <laughs> they need to take a chill pill. Um, but uh, yeah. so, so to go back to the to the podcast. So you start going minute by minute. You you develop this great chemistry and, and and ability to carry out conversations. You have different guests on who have different you know aspects and different um you know perspectives on 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 the minute that they're analyzing but for for you when you when you finish that first um movie when you finish back to the future the very first one was it like oh man we got two more of these to do or was it like i cannot wait to talk about back to the future two and three i we were so excited that we we uh had our our listeners we did a we did a itunes review drive and we're like yeah if we can get to 50 we'll come back early. And we got to 50 like a week later. And it was like, Oh no, that was way faster than we thought it was going to be. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, yeah, the gap between one and two was just so small that we didn't have time. Yeah. And weeks, by the time we six weeks and then the gap between two and three was so long in comparison. But by that time it really did have a feeling of like it, we, we kind of felt at that point that part three was going to be like real loud. as long yeah. as we didn't like get lazy it was going to be like a really fun 
way to wrap up the show. So in retrospect, I'm kind of grateful because each, each hiatus kind of did different things to the show. Uh huh. In what way though? So, so how did, what was the hiatus? Like what, what was the big change in the show from one to two and then from two to three? Well, one to two, there really just, I didn't feel like there was one. It, 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 it feel like it felt like there was a hiatus for the listener and but for us, we just never – I don't remember us ever really stopping making the show in any meaningful way. I mean, Scott, what do you think? No, no. I, I, I think we – I maybe we took two weeks off, but we really just rolled right into the second one. And um, I think that was actually – ended up being a benefit for, for us creatively because while we were exhausted by the end of the second one, yeah, I think that – you know, with all of the, uh, you know, revisiting 1955 and everything back to the future was still fresh in our head. So all of, we can make reference, make direct references to things we referenced in back to the future, the, our first season, um, in our second season. And I think it made the second season stronger as a result. And, and, you know, we were able to comfortably take a break but like a longer break between two and three, because three is a little more removed from the other two movies. Yeah. And I, I remember watching the first minutes because we, you know, we, we, we watch it minute by minute um, before recording. And I remember like missing the characters watching three. Yeah. I remember being like, Oh yeah, I forgot about them. And I remember not getting that with two. Cause I remember it just felt like keeping the machine going. Keeping the machine yeah. Going. Yeah. No, I get that. I get that. You know, um, three is removed. And, you know, that's the one I've, yeah, I've focused on for the last two seasons of this podcast is Back to the Future 3. Because as a child, for some reason, Back to the Future 3 was my favorite. And I don't know why. It just stuck. Maybe oh, wow. it's because I'm from Texas and I like the good yeah. Western. You know, I'm, I'm a Southerner mm-hmm. at heart. And, you know, I uh, grew up on John Wayne and Clint Eastwood. And, you know, that's what all my grandparents mm-hmm. and my dad watched. So maybe I was partial to it already. But there was something that was just so much... I don't know. It was just so much fun. And I guess I, I guess when I look back at it, there was more of a mountain to climb technologically, right, for Doc and Marty. They had, they, there, was a bit, there was a higher threshold of, of error there. You had to clear this in order to get back to uh, the future. You know, in the first mm-hmm. one, it's like they knew exactly when a lightning storm would strike. They knew, they, okay, if I can harness that energy, put in the flux capacitor, I can send you back to 85. You know, the second one, they had Mr. Fusion. They figured that whole thing out. But in the third one, they were literally, they were in a time where there was no gasoline. You know, there wasn't a, mm-hmm. you know, they didn't know when the lightning was going to strike. They really were, it was, it was like, you know, it was like Bear grills in the wild. Like they had to be stripped down yeah. to, their, to their essence and figure out a way you know, to get that DeLorean. So I guess maybe I thought yeah. that there was a, you know, and, and honestly that That's train true, scene though, at, yeah. at the end was awesome. Yeah. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I, I never really thought about it like that. Yeah. But it, it's kind of like their Iron Man and three, like <laughs> who, who, who are they when they, who are they when they have none of their toys or gadgets? Yeah. And, and like, yeah, like I, I do remember, like I just, three has so much more pleasant moments to me than two. Like just the, him having that huge freaking ice tea machine. Yeah, the refrigerator. Um, I don't like. Yeah, the refrigerator, and 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 there were many. Looking back at it, right, literally right now, I, I I'm remembering three a little bit more fondly than two, just because I do think it's allowed to breathe more, and I think two is just doing so much work, and it's impressive too. But it it it's sometimes not the most fun to like rewatch. Hmm. Yeah, I feel like you. If you watch two, you have to watch three right after, in, in order yeah. to like yeah, to breathe like and kind of relax. Hurt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two is so yeah. dense. There's so much. Mm-hmm. Two, two is difficult to watch on its own. Like I don't, I don't know that it holds up as its own movie. Um, like, and which is ironic because it always seems to be the one that's on like TBS or whatever. It, yeah. It just, just part two. Um, but, uh, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't hold up on its own. I think as much like it, it works as part of the trilogy. Uh, but that's the only time I ever watch it outside of, you know, the podcast where I talked about it a minute at a time. 
I, 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 whenever I think about Back to the Future Two, it's the uh, it's the threshold I have to cross to go from part one to part three. Uh, and that's not to say that I don't enjoy it. I still do, but I never think to watch part two on its own. You know what's so weird is. Well, I look at middle chapter and I think everyone's favorite part of two is the 2015 stuff. Right. I mean, is that, yeah. is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For, um, and like, I think about what's another middle chapter that I love. And I was like, Oh, two towers. Um, the, the, the I think the reason most people really watch two towers when they're not marathoning them is to watch Helm's deep. Mm-hmm. And I just think it's funny how Helm's deep is just buried like three, two hours into the movie. Mm-hmm. And yet I, w- I wonder how many kids grew up like taking the VHS of Back to the Future 2 out after the 2015 stuff was over. Mm. That is a great point. That's interesting. That's a great point. Yeah. And, you know, uh, it's interesting to think about that. So let's spend a minute on, on the future, though, in, in Back to the Future Part 2, because that was an interesting point. I think that is everybody's favorite segment of that film. And, uh, and the, the detail that went into it, I just want to real quick. What was y'all's favorite part of, of, of 2015, future 2015? You got to pick one thing that you liked more than anything. What was it? Realizing how – and realizing using background details how energy worked in the future. <laughs> uh, like realizing that everything runs on garbage, um, <laughs> which, which they, there's no, there's no uh, like direct reference to that in the, in, in the movie. But, but if you look at background stuff and you take context clues, uh, which we, you know, had to do while we were doing this, doing this thing, cause I, they land in the alley for like a straight week. Um, I, you know, you, you start to realize that like, Oh, that, that, uh, that garbage is bundled up really nicely. And it seems to fit really nicely in this, in this dumpster looking thing that's attached to this building that, says Mr. F- that says fusion technologies on it. And Oh my God, this whole place runs on garbage. Um, you know, and just and realizing that is, you know, really, that was really, I remember how gratifying that moment was, uh, when we were, uh, <laughs> yeah. recording that. And, and I think the theme, the, the, the thing that I remember taking the most away from part two and, and Scott and I, it's not like we didn't know this before, but it really just hammered at home what an important part production design and just design in general can play into any movies, but it, it, particularly these blockbusters and these these franchise movies that, that the public seems to love. Is that I think the secret sauce is just communication and allowing artists to like, really have just imagination buffets, you know? And get creative. And there's no reason that the technical side of filmmaking be any less inspired or creative than like the the writing and the the more art, clear, the more obviously artistic parts of stuff, you know? Yeah, no, I you know what? I, I it took me, man, several probably several, you know, viewings of that film until I made that connection, Scott, of like, holy hell, this whole place is run on garbage and you know we should have known from the end of the first movie when he's talking about i need fuel and, and with mr fusion but you're not really thinking that the whole city is going to be run off that and and uh right. and nick i think you make great points for me for some reason in that 2015 future more than the hoverboard more than even the air mags the thing that always got me was the way they served the pepsi in, in the cafe 80s uh, for some reason, I love that gimmick of coming oh, up yeah, I love and serving that, that and, and how the bottle looked. When I was a kid, I was right. like, I cannot I, – I was I wanted that Pepsi Perfect so bad, where you know, I, I spent way more money than I should have buying one of those Pepsi Perfects that came out a couple, more, a couple <laughs> years ago. But I had to have it because when I was a kid, that was the coolest thing in the world for me. Now, so y- you, uh, y'all being longtime lovers of the film, let me, t- let, me, let me know if I'm the only one. When I was a kid and I'd watch Back to the Future Part 2 – I le- legitimately thought Marty's son was a different actor. Was I the only one? Was I that? Was I a, the slow kid? Here, we're a little slow in I'm Texas. Pers- I don't think I'm the person to ask because I think I already knew. You knew like, already. I don't, I, yeah. I don't. I don't remember ever not knowing that that was Michael J. Fox. Um, For and some reason, it was right it, over my head. Him and the yeah. daughter. It went right over my head. 
Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't know if I had been previously exposed to the idea of uh, actors playing multiple roles in a thing or their own relatives, or if I had seen something where that had happened before, and so I was familiar with it beforehand. I'm not sure, but I, I don't remember not knowing that. Yeah. No. Well, I just want to know if I was by myself. But to go back to a point that uh, you made earlier, you're probably not. <laughs> I'm, but maybe, <laughs> maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm, I'm probably in the minority on that one. Um, to go back to a point though, you made earlier, Nick, that I wanted to touch on. The, I think, the, and and Scott, you were alluding to it too. We talk about the denseness of the second film and, and how you. It's not really a great. It's not really a great standalone. Like you either have to mm-hmm. watch it right after Back to the Future Two, or or you have to watch Back to the Future Three right after you watch Back to the Future Two or Back to the Future One, and you know what I'm saying. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that it it probably the second film suffered from that filming the sequels at the same time thing because I think the Bobs had in their mind, okay, we're going to set up a lot in part two. They were going to pay off in the third one. And I find mm-hmm. that in trilogies that do that, that do the back-to-back film, it typically – that second film for some reason always suffers. I go – to a uh, a trilogy that kind of got worse over time, but uh, you know, I, I go to the the Pirates of the Caribbean trilogy and uh, the that first three movies. The second one had so many things that Dead Man's Chest had so many setups that weren't paid off until the end of a three hour movie, which was the sequel, the the Pirates of the Caribbean three. Would you say right. though that, that that's probably the reason why they're trying to set stuff up to pay off in the third one, so the second one suffers? I, I think yeah. there's I think there's a, a bit of that, but I I think what the real problem comes down to in in Back to the Future Part Two is that it has a villain, and Back to the Future movies aren't supposed to have a villain. Like they they're it's it's all the villain the antagonist of Back to the Back to the Future series should always be circumstance. Yeah, and that's, that's what it is point. in the first one. Mm-hmm. And that's what it is in the third one. But for some reason, in the second one, Bill is an evil mastermind, and it just it it isn't it isn't the same thing. Uh, yeah. and, and so, so I think I think part two is just a very different movie as a result, and and so then it kind of sticks out like a sore thumb because it doesn't have the same heart that the first and third one have, where there is no real villain. Like you, you have mad dog. Sure. And Biff is in the first one, but they are more nuisances than they are like actual villains. Yeah. That they're, are. they're, they're, they're just as, they're just as much an obstacle as like just time itself. They're just, they're just challenging. <laughs> right. Right. No, you know what? That's a great point. I've never thought about the first two films really didn't have a villain. The antagonist was the, the circumstances they find they found themselves in. And then when you have evil Biff and you have him as the, you know, it, it felt real dark. And that's another thing that, you know, is always talked about in trilogies. The second one always ends up being the darkest of the trilogy for some reason. It just falls that way, you know, whether it be the Star Wars trilogy or the Indiana Jones trilogy even though temple of doom was a prequel it was still the second one it was the darkest one for some reason and uh you know i I think that's just one of those things but um i I never thought about you know the second one had a villain and that might have been what was weighing it down you you agree with that nick it just it just uh i don't know i i think you you go into movies expecting certain things like i know i go to see a lot of movies like you know for for the villain and and I, I feel kind of cheated if like I go to see a James Bond movie and the villain is like, you know, uh, the, the guy from Munich and his evil plan is he's going to steal water. Uh, <laughs> and, I'm, I'm, uh, and yeah, and you're like, I kind of you kind of want the, the the guy stroking the cat. But yeah, for Back to the Future, these characters are just so going back to that desperation. It's so much fun to watch them try to outrun time or try to outsmart time that. Yeah, having a human bad guy for Marty and Doc to like punch and kick and and fight, it 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 feels weird. It just doesn't it just doesn't fit the world that was shown to us in the first one. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And it's always great how like you know the beautiful irony of the movie is that they have a time machine, but they are always short on time. Like oh, I mean, even uh-huh. Marty yeah. calls reference to it in the third film. Why do we got to cut these things so damn close? 
And, you know, it's, right. it's just funny. You know, you have a time machine, <laughs> but you're always, you know, running to make sure you have enough time. It is it is a great thing. Yeah. But Back to the Future is a world filled with so many characters and so many, like, great supporting characters. You know, there's Marty and Doc. We all love Marty and Doc. But there's so many great yeah. characters on the periphery. For you, Scott, we'll start with you. What was your who's your favorite just side character? Someone who wasn't in the center of the action. Who did you just kind of like who was out there existing in the universe? Oh man. The problem is that Nick and I came up with so many characters who aren't really there. Um sure. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that it's it's hard to narrow down. Um, oh man. Uh I I, I found myself, um, I, I don't know. I, I, I found myself really liking, uh, the, um, I, 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 I it, it's hard to pinpoint just one, but I, I, I think I, I just found myself really like, pro- I, I, well, probably that guy stole his wallet guy. I mean, I, that <laughs> no, everyone I, loves him. I, everyone yeah, loves I mean, him. He's, He's pretty great. Um, he doesn't have like a big, you know, background or whatever. Cause like, I mean, if I, if I could pick anybody from like <laughs> the characters that we talked about on the show, like I can't, uh, I can't imagine not picking Fury Lorraine, um, who we, <laughs> who we created as part of, uh, alternate 1985. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I don't know, probably, probably that guy or, um, uh, I don't know. I it's 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 difficult because they they're all just when you when you've talked about all the, these movies for three hundred and forty five episodes, um, it, it it all becomes a blur more so than when you're just watching them as a whole. So, so there's a lit, know, there's, there think, might be a litany. What do you think, Nick? I think my favorite characters actually come from part two. Weirdly enough, and yeah, it is it is a combination. Of us, but it's also a combination of the movie uh, and it's officers Reese and Foley. Ooh, yeah, that's oh, good. Oh, yeah, those are they good are ones. two. So they, so they, they show up and help an unconscious Lorraine. No, no, an unconscious uh, Jennifer get get back home. And you know they're they're two kind of and they have cool lines. They have costumes, and I was like, oh yeah, Reese and Foley. And I remember who was our was it Chris Beth? Who was our guest during the Reese and Foley minutes? Was it Preeti and Allie? No, it was just Allie. It was just Ali. Okay, cool. Yeah. And, you know, we were like, oh, that's cool. Cause like, you know, two cool female cops in the future, like just trying to survive Hill Valley, like that's in Scott and I's wheelhouse. But what really clinched it for me was, um, I was trying to, we were trying to come up with things to do during the weekend edition of the show that our, our Patreon donors get every weekend. And I was reading the novelization of 1941 which was which was written by Bob Gale. And that's the excuse I had to like buy the book on Amazon and read it. And two characters that show up in the book are privates Reese and Foley. Oh wow. So, so I, I, I don't I would love to ask Bob Gale one day if those are like two people that he knew, if it's like a if it's a, like a Walt Flanagan situation or if it's just like I don't know. I I just I and I would hope to maybe one day get his permission to like carry on the, the recent Foley tradition in movie, <laughs> movies to come. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Some future stories for the recent Foley. Okay. Hey guys, yeah. uh, y'all been amazing. Great guest. Uh, two more things that I want to ask y'all before I get you out of here. First off, you did sure. the 300 plus minutes. I know it's a hard question. It's a stupid question, but I want to ask it to see if you have an answer. Do either one of y'all have a favorite minute from the trilogy? Yep. All right, I what, do. what do you got, Scott? Oh, shit. Uh, my favorite minute of the trilogy is, uh, I, I don't remember the exact, I don't remember the minute, but I know what's in the minute. Go ahead. Um, it's in, it's in back to the future. And it's the minute where, uh, where doc hears on the video, 1.21 gigawatts yes. and then repeats it. Screaming at Marty, running out of the garage, runs across the yard, and then Marty follows him. And what the hell's a gigawatt? You know, goes into his uh, goes into his house and finds Doc sitting in a chair, talking to uh, a photograph of of Thomas Edison. <laughs> 
That is um, such a talking, great pick. That is such oh, a it, great pick. It's such – it's a perfect minute. Like <sighs> I just remember Nick and I were just – laughing hysterically at how ridiculous this minute is and what you just we love it to pieces um that's that's the most fun and i think that week we didn't have a guest on it was just nick and i and it, we were just dying laughing God, that's yeah talking a about a, yeah just talking about doc just r- having to run across the yard screaming 1.21 gigawatts and then <laughs> and then just just sitting down and talking to a photo of Thomas Edison about how difficult this situation is going to be. God, it's amazing. Pick. And then, yeah, amazing. And then, and then Michael, and then, yeah, and then Marty goes, what the hell is a gigawatt? Like, it's yeah, just yeah. so, so many great cuts and so many great, I, I remember that was the moment where Scott and I kind of turned to each other on Skype and was like, oh, we could, we could use this as like a tool for like filmmaking. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. What about you, Nick? Though, do you have a favorite minute, or is that the same one? Minute? Yeah, that's. Def- I think that's like the best minute of the movie. I mean, I know that sounds so weird, but it just everything is just in that minute, and I, I just remember all of us noticing, like, yeah, that's kind of everything. Um, um, I really any any the uh, the cool thing about the show is watching it minute by minute. You really do get to soak everything in. And the way that you don't when you watch a movie, the way that the filmmakers intended. And um, <laughs> one of those things is just you really get a sense of what a knockdown, drag out, dynamite actress Leah Thompson is. Oh, yeah. Doesn't get and, enough credit, and, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that's one of the reoccurring themes is we're just like, God, why isn't she in so much? And, and you know, a uh, million reasons and a lot of them are bullshit. But I, I, I yeah. And, and, and so getting to really soak in these performances and see the nuances that they, that they give this big, again, this big summer tentpole movie. Yeah, no, you, you're right about Leah Thompson. She does not get enough credit. Um, this is, this is the question I love to ask everybody who comes on this show just to see where they would like to see it go as a fan of the series. Um, if they, if they ever made another one, if, if it happens, if they did a book, whatever, if there was a continuation to part three and they made an official part four, what time period would you like to see them go to? Nick, let's start with you. Um, I would want it. I would really be interested to see, uh, like Vic, Victorian time or maybe no, like, maybe like, like, like the, around the time that like. Leave Extraordinary Gentleman takes place like this mm. right thing, like 19, 1899, 1900. Like, you know, we're about to enter this glorious new century. And like, I think it would be interesting to see the DeLorean in Europe. I think like like London would be really cool or like Bombay in like the 1800s. Just, just, just kidding. It would be it's such a piece of Americana that it would be cool to. I know this is a super bad example, but I think one of the best thing about Crystal Skull is that shot of Indiana Jones watching a, a flying saucer rise from the ground. <laughs> I'm just like, I was like, Oh yes, do that <laughs> Spielberg. And, and, and so I think it would be cool to see, do something different. I think I would be the biggest one. Uh, for me, I mean, I don't, I, it's not a back to the future movie if they leave Hill Valley. So, right. Yeah. Uh, totally. Yeah. I get that. So I, I get that too. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like you got it. You got to stay in Hill Valley. And unfortunately, you know, we've we've seen we've seen the the sort of twenties uh, prohibition era in the game, yeah, so that's out. That's right. We've seen the old we've seen the old west, and and I think the industrial era like time period isn't that much different in the west. Yeah, um, and then especially when you take into account the video games already kind of did that in a cool way. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Um, and, uh, and, and then you've got, you know, what, what do you got left? You got the, the forties, which isn't a whole lot different from the twenties. Yeah. Um, and, and then you've got the sixties, which isn't a whole lot different from the fifties and the seventies, which isn't a whole lot different from the eighties. And so oh, I think I know where you're going with this. And so you're, you're out of it. Do you? Because, I oh wait, no. Do. Um, okay. So, well, then I have a new answer. Yeah. Okay, I might have so, one too now. So, uh, so I, I, I feel like all of that is, is gone. And I, I think I would be interested in seeing the first and it's, it's going to sound dark, but I'm going to say, I don't want to see the dark version of this. 
I, I want to see what a light version of this would be, but I want to see them go far enough in the future that it's like the post apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 like where it's it's not it's not fresh it's so far ahead right. that we're you like a mean- hundred years past the post apocalypse and so there's like a new society in the hill it's like so, new hill valley yeah yeah so it's kind of like after you know in in first contact Star Trek it's like there was a great war but now yes. it's over and now yes. we're rebuilding yeah absolutely that's what I want to see something like that because. It, I, I just don't think there's any decade periods left in California that you could really do justice to, I don't think. Because um, I think they're all too similar to stuff we've already had. I would love to see – I don't care if it's like a six-issue comic or something, but I would love to see Hill Valley 1995. I was I was thinking Hill Valley in the '90s when as Scott yeah. was talking, I was like that actually might be an interesting thing of Marty having to go, you know, to high school, uh, you know, or in just, just, just Marty Marty going to buy Nevermind, <laughs> <laughs> or you what know, or you this? know, or you know, early two thousands Marty, you know, instead of you know uh, Van Halen, it's Limp Biscuits, and he's trying to figure it out. There, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot, there are a lot of routes. That would be that would be very in line with Back to the Future because we would be watching it and being and saying like, oh, this is really. This is really funny because it's the 90s and look at all these 90s references and that's like what what a dated period this was. But then for Marty, it would be the future. So it would be a really weird dichotomy. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> Marty and the audience. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it'd be interesting. It would be interesting to watch, though. I, I do think. I do think. Yeah. Well, hey, guys, I really do appreciate y'all taking the time. Before I get you out of here, do y'all have anything coming up? I know you have your Dueling Genre Network and you have all these podcasts that you're doing. Uh, take this time. Plug away anything you got coming up. Uh, yeah. So, um, before wrapping up back to the future, I actually launched a new minute by minute podcast, uh, Spider-Man minute where myself and my co-host Zach Luna go through the Spider-Man movies one minute at a time. And, uh, those are, that is so much fun to do. Uh, Nick was our first guest. So if you, if you like Nick or if you're a fan of back to the future minute, um, he's on that, uh, our, our first week of guests, I think week two of that show. Um, so I, I recommend checking that out. Even if you think like, I, I'm not a big enough Spider-Man fan to care about that. I, I feel like our show would surprise you. I, feel, I, I, I think I heard that a lot. Like when we were first starting, people tried it because they were like, well, I like Scott on back to the future minute, but I, I don't know about this Spider-Man thing. that seems weird. Uh, and and then now they're they're just as much diehard listeners of that as they were Back to the Future. So that's well, that's pretty and, cool. And from an outsider's perspective, I think the secret is I think you and Zach are both populists. I think you want people to get into Spider Man more, or you're not like guarding the secrets from like the normies or anything. Yeah, <laughs> that's very true. That's very true. Um, and then uh, and then Nick and I uh, we've actually already started, but we have our new minute by minute podcast where we are actually uh, breaking down the films of Edgar Wright one minute at a time. Mm. Uh, we start we start Shaun of the Dead in October, uh, but right now we're actually we're actually going through um, a rewatch of Spaced, uh, the television series that uh, they did prior to Shaun of the Dead. So we're doing that right now on the feed. So you can already subscribe and go check that out and listen to us there. Um, but we will be starting Shaun of the Dead on October 2nd, and I'm really excited about that. Awesome. Nick, anything you want to plug or promote? Um, You know, nothing that this guy hasn't already said. It just everything is on DuelingGenre.com. That's where you can find Geek by Night, our audio drama that we're, we're working on right now, and freaking Harry Potterman and Lord of the Rings Minute and Immunities. It, it, yeah, so just DuelingGenre.com has everything that we're working on. Hey, that sounds great. Well, uh, Scott, you're going to have to let me know when you get to The Amazing Spider-Man 2. I'm sure that's going to be a fun, fun few minutes there. Uh, but anyway, yeah, thank you. It'll be interesting. <laughs> it'll definitely be interesting. I actually interesting. already know what minute I want. <laughs> oh, there you go. Oh, nice. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Have a good one. What have you done now?